trust you today. Um, um, we are having Professor Jonathan Hill today as our last guest of the uh, design talk series of this term. Um, and now it is very hard to introduce you, but I will try to keep it short and um, a bit more formal, <laughs> let's say. Um, Jonathan Hill is an architect and architectural historian. Uh, he's a professor of architecture and visual theory at Bartlett School of Architecture in London, where he is program director of architectural design and Phil PhD and a tutor of architecture and master of architecture unit 12 with Elizabeth Doe and Matthew Butcher. Um, he is author of many books, in, including the illegal architecture, actions of architecture, immaterial architecture, weather architecture, a landscape of architecture, history and fiction, and the architecture of ruins design on the past, present and future. He is also editor of uh, Occupying Architecture and Architecture, the subject matter, uh, subject is matter, sorry, and research by design, and also co-editor of Critical Architecture. Um, today's lecture is called Designs on History. Uh, I believe it will be based on his current research. I'm not quite sure, but there might be a new book of his uh, coming this year about the same topic. So um, we are very uh, excited to hear it from you. Um, his research influenced many researchers today in the field of architectural design, and I believe in this, uh, everyone in this room is very excited to hear uh, your lecture. So now we will have the presentation and it will be followed up by a discussion session. Um, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, we are looking forward to lecture. Now I will leave it to you from here. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very, very much for that really nice introduction. And it's a, it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, what I'm going to talk about um, uh, is sort of design research. And I'm going to sort of set that into a, a sort of context, both in my, my own work, research and teaching, uh, but it's in a sort of, sort of wider context as well. And I'm going to sort of explain really how I came to be interested in the subject. And uh, one of the things I suppose was that um, I, I did my um, professional degree at the Architectural Association and finished in the early 80s in London. And I was really struck by when um, the AA, it was a very uh, good time for the AA. It was a really fascinating school, lots of interesting people teaching there and studying there. But one of the things that struck me was that at the, um, those of you who might have been to the AA know that it's in a series of Georgian houses in, um, in a very beautiful square in London. And... Every year at that time, all the results at the end of the year were put up on the wall uh, and listing everybody who'd sort of passed and, and, and their awards. And then virtually everybody had behind, beside their name had an asterisk. Uh, and if you looked down at the bottom of the page uh, on the sheet and the asterisk said, subject to completion of history and theory dissertation. And I, this was a very strange thing, though. The A was a very competitive school. There was lots of pressure to do well. Uh, but all the emphasis was on design and, to some extent, technology, and, um, and not on history and theory. And many people actually completed their history and theory dissertation years after finishing at the AA. Uh, and I thought this was quite strange at the time, because one of the things that um, the AA had an amazing book collection, uh, and it also had and still has one of the best architectural bookshops in, in London. And at that time, it was in the basement of the entrance. Uh, and if you went into the, uh, that bookshop, one of the things that struck you was that you, you saw lots of books by AA staff. And one of the things that when Alvin Barsky was uh, chair of the AA, one of the things he did was to set up an AA publications uh, publishing house. And so the, it was rather strange, I thought, on... on the aid at that time didn't recognize the importance of the conjunction of designing and writing for their students, but it did recognize it for their staff because all these books uh, that, you know, Daniel Lieber skinned at the time, uh, Rem Koolhaas, many other people, was they were all written, they were combining projects and, and, and texts. And they were about the conjunction of writing and, and, um, uh, and drawing. 
And, and this really struck me at the time. And um, I, I, it was always an interest of mine to um, develop this conjunction, this creative relationship between writing and designing. Uh, and at the Bartlett, I, um, one of the things I do is I direct the architectural design PhD program. And the architectural design PhD program was actually developed in uh, the mid 1990s. So it's been going for quite a while now. Uh, and the idea to start this program really began a few years earlier. And for me, it really began with seeing that, you know, being at the AA and thinking about um, this uh, creative conjunction, the possibility of this creative conjunction of writing and, um, and designing. And we were fortunate at the Bartlett and at UCL uh, and at the University of London that time that, that people could recognize the value and the potential of an architect design PhD. Uh, and I was at the time actually full-time at the Bartlett and I was running the undergraduate program and the, the master's design studio. And the, uh, the PhD program began, it was a very small, it began with three, myself and two other colleagues, Yoye Manalapulu and Penelope Haralambadu. We were all teaching at the school. We were the three students. And our supervisor was uh, Professor Phil Table, who was then director of the school. Uh, and so it had this very inter intimate, uh, interesting relationship. And we, we thought that really it was sort of ethical to rather than announce the program, of an architect design PhD to actually test it out on ourselves. Uh, and so we, we didn't, we decided we wouldn't advertise it uh, externally beyond the, the three of us until uh, one of us had finished. And always the uh, intention would be that I would be the guinea pig for it and it would be tested out on me first. And I, I completed it in 2000. And then at that point, I then took over running the program. And we felt once we somebody passed it, we then thought we could then promote it beyond uh, beyond UCL and beyond uh, to, to a, a students who would want to, to pursue it. Uh, and to give you a little bit of a context, the, the first um, PhD in creative writing in the UK was actually, I think, completed in 1994, at the University of East Anglia. And that was basically consisted of a, of a novel uh, and a commentary on a novel. Uh, there have been a number of uh, art and practice-based PhD programs at other universities, but we were the first architecture program of, of this kind in the UK. Uh, and as far as we're aware, we're the first with a graduating student uh, anywhere internationally. And some doctoral programs define themselves as different from the traditional PhD. But we always wanted to emphasize that ours is a PhD within the mold of what you expect a PhD be, to be in the UK. And the only really significant difference is that while the traditional PhD is purely written, the architectural design PhD combines a project and a text that share a research theme and have a productive relationship. And as, as I'm going to be talking today, some of the student, uh, some of the work I'm going to be showing is by current and past students. And this is Im image is actually um, one of uh, Ifeanya Lianyi, who is in sort of the final year of her PhD now, who is also teaching at the the Bartlett. Hmm? Now, oh yeah, it has gone sl slowly. Um, this is another image of Ify's. Uh, and um, one of the things that uh, was interesting about when we decided to, what to call the program, I think some people thought we would call it maybe a design and theory program because it was drawing and text. But we didn't want to do that because the, uh, I think otherwise people would assume that theory is purely text-based. And we see drawing and building as key parts of the process of de developing theories as well as practices of architecture. And in the PhD thesis, there was always an academic text of around 60,000 words, but the relationship between project and text depends on the research subject. So the design project can be filmed, sculpted, built or drawn and employ any media that is interesting and appropriate to the subject. And actually Ify is, is writing, um, she's interested in the idea of the architectural storyteller and she's writing and drawing architectural uh, fairy tales. And consequently, one of the things that happens is that the architectural design PhD students often create a thesis that integrates a number of ways of working. 
And I think if you produce a singular piece of work with one type of output, you maybe tend to have a singular idea of authorship. But if you work between media, as you do with the Architectural Design PhD, you need to realize and even conceptualize your place within that process. And there are currently about 50 to 60 students enrolled on the PhD program at any one time. And each year we have regular seminars and events and an annual conference. And if you go to the Bartlett website, you'll see the, the conference publication that we have from each year uh, when we have sort of international critics who come to the conference. Uh, one of the things I think that was interesting is that when we started the program, it, it was um, primarily intended, I think, for people who studied architecture beforehand. Uh, and one of the things that you recognized was that um, while the uh, architect professional qualification is sort of, in a sense, it's, it's, it's limited by the profession to some extent, we wanted to have, uh, enjoy the fact that the, the PhD program is not accredited by the profession. And so it was always intended to have a much broader conception of architecture and a conception of architecture beyond the work of architects. And so what, what's actually been really interesting is that uh, probably at any one time, maybe two thirds of the students have an architectural background, but there've been a number of artists. There's been a medical practitioner, site specific poet, scientists, geographers, and urbanists. So in a sense, they're, they're people who are all interested in architecture as a subject, even if they don't have an architectural background. And one of the things that's been to our advantage is that um, UCL is a large multidisciplinary university. And the, for the principal in the UK system, you always have two supervisors. And the principal doctoral supervisor is always in the Bartlett School of Architecture. But the second supervisor can be anywhere in UCL. And this has been a really interesting consequence of it. It's, it's enabled us to develop connections far more than probably any other part of the Bartlett with other parts of UCL. So that the super, second supervisor might be in anthropology or computer science, or medical science or fine art, for example. And our intention has always been that the doctoral subjects and supervisions should be as broad as the discipline of architecture. And we've wanted to connect research to related disciplines to foster productive and rewarding collaborations. And also within the Bartlett, there's a, a long standing um, connection with the architectural history and theory program, which was founded uh, before our program. And actually, as far as we can tell, the first architectural uh, history and theory PhD at the Bartlett was actually Charles Jenk's book, Modern Movements, which was supervised by, by Rainer Ballon. Now, I, as well as being an architect, I'm also an architectural historian. Uh, and so I'm gonna try to sort of connect the architectural design uh, doctorate to the history of architecture and design research. And I, I think in contemporary discourse and practice, it's quite familiar to discuss design research as if it is new to architecture. Uh, and we have actually taken the opposite uh, strategy and it's a very important aspect of my work is to try to sort of always um, is historic, look historically at contemporary uh, conditions. And, and I think if you look at the history of the architect, um, the architect design PhD is a comparative new qualification, but actually its methods and means are not. And you could say that they've been invaluable to the architect for over 500 years. And the history of design is independent with the history of drawing. And the term design actually derives from the Italian disegno, which means drawing, but crucially associates uh, drawing a line with drawing forth an idea. And the Renaissance reasserted classical antiquities appreciation of the timeless immaterial geometries of ideal forms, but introduced a fundamental change in perception to proclaim that drawing mediates seamlessly between the mind and the world, allowing the three visual arts of architecture, painting and sculpture to be acknowledged as arts concerned with ideas. So actually the command of drawing, not building, transformed the architect's status, establishing the influential myth that architecture results from individual artistic creation, not the accumulated knowledge of a construction team. Now, if you think about that, each of the, um, uh, uh, the disciplines or the practices of painting, sculpture and architecture, they all acquired their new status due to, uh, at the same time, due to this increase, increased status being given to drawing and drawing being associated with ideas and the bringing forth of ideas. 
But in contrast to the architectural drawing, which is seen in relation to other drawings in a building, the painting and sculpture are unique and they can thus appear closer to the world of ideas and further from the material world. And the architectural drawing depends on two related but distinct concepts. One indicates that drawing is an intellectual artistic activity distant from the grubby materiali materiality of construction. And the other emphasizes the architect's mastery of the collaborative building process. And crucially, creativity as well as confusion has arisen from this contradiction. And this is actually an image from uh, Palladio's four books. In 1563, uh, this book, obviously the four books was published in 1570. Uh, and in 1563, the painter and architect, Giorgio Fossari founded the first art academy, which was called the Academ Academia del Disegno in Florence. And that offered instruction in drawing and geometry uh, rather than craft skills. And it provided a, a model for art and architecture schools probably ever since. In the new division of labor, architects acquired complementary means to practice architecture, namely drawing, writing, and building. And to affirm their uh, advanced status, architects began to theorize architecture, both for themselves and for their patrons, ensuring that the authored book became more valuable to architects than to painters and sculptors, whose artistic status was more secure and means to acquire and complete commissions as demanding. And I think this is one of the things that has allowed us to develop the architectural design PhD, because it, it taps into this 500 year tradition of the architectural book. And in a way, the architectural book is the model for the, the PhD thesis in architecture. Okay, so that's the model on Vitruvius's treatise from the first century BCE. Uh, Alberti's 10 books on architecture was the first thorough investigation of the Renaissance architect as artist and intellectual. And it was written in about 1450 and printed in 1485. But the first architectural book to be printed with illustrations was actually, the, uh, this is a, an image from that. And that is uh, Francesco Colonna's 1499 book, Hypnorotomachia Polyphili. And this book very crucially established the multimedia interdependence of text and image that has been essential to architectural books ever since. And one model for the architectural book, Hypnorotomachia Polyphili, is a fictional narrative illustrated with pictorial drawings. And a second model is the analytical manifesto illustrated with orthogonal drawings, such as Palladio's four books from 1570. And a further literary model, the manual conveys practical knowledge and is illustrated with diagrams. But crucially, these models are not hermetic, and many architectural books refer to more than one, as in Palladio's attention to practical matters. And the relationship also between history and design was important to Colonna and to Palladio. And historical references appear in both books, but for different purposes. In one, they enrich a specific story. In the other, they legitimize generic solutions. <laughs> One of the things that uh, interests me and has, has been developed particularly in the book that I'm working on now, which is Designs on History, which relates to the title of this lecture, is sort of architecture and architects' concern for history. And the Renaissance's concern for history was obviously inseparable for its own history. It obviously, after, after all, it was a Renaissance. And Erwin uh, Panofsky identifies a creative and critical nostalgia for classical antiquity that he says distinguishes the real Renaissance from all those pseudo or proto Renaissances that had taken place during the Middle Ages. Uh, and one book I've greatly uh, enjoyed and been influenced by is a book called Anachronic Renaissance from uh, 2010. And in that Alexander Nagel and Christopher Wood write this, and this is a quote, the ability of the work of art to hold incompatible models in suspension without deciding is the key to art's anachronic quality. Its ability really to fetch a past, create a past, perhaps even to fetch the future. And obviously you could replace, replace the word art by architecture. And it's this idea that by looking at the past, you're also creating the future.
Um, one of my uh, most uh, pleasurable times doing research, you know, obviously it's very lovely to get access to archives. And this is actually an illustrate, an image from William Kent, who was a very uh, influential English architect of the early 18th century. And his sketchbook is held in the Bodleian Library in Oxford. And, and when I went, in, went there one, for a day and then I was just given the sketchbook. So it's like not given a book, but given the original sketchbook to look through for the day. Uh, and I think it's a very interesting um, uh, sketchbook. It's, it consists of words, images, drawings, uh, analysis. And, and people have written about themselves for millennia, but the formation of modern identity in the early 18th century is associated with a type of diary writing. And uh, my, Michel Foucault rather evocatively describes this type of diary writing as a technology of the self. Uh, by which he means the process of self-examination by which moral character and behavior are constructed and reimagined. An objectivity may be an aspiration, but no diary is entirely truthful and the diarist cannot fail to edit and reinvent life while reflecting upon it, altering the past as well as influencing the future. And when I, I, I read um, uh, Foucault's uh, text on the technology of the self, I started to think about how this has very strong parallels to design. And we could say that equivalent to a visual, textual and spatial diary, the process of, of design from one drawing to the next iteration and from one project to another is itself an autobiographical technology of the self, formulating a design ethos for an indi individual all in the studio. And often a design does not get built and an architect must be persuasive to see that it does. And sometimes building is not the best means to explore architectural ideas. Consequently, influential architects tend to write, draw, publish, and talk, as well as build. And Palladio is a notable, notable early exponent of this tradition. Le Corbusier, Arata Isasaki, uh, Alison Smithson, and Rem Koolhaas are later exemplars. And the relations between the drawing, text, and building are multidirectional. For example, drawing may lead to building, writing may lead to drawing, or building may lead to writing and drawing. And if each of us here was to list the architectural works that inspire us, some would be drawings, some would be texts, and others would be buildings either visited or described in drawings and texts. An interdependent, multi-directional web of influences, drawing, writing, and building have together stimulated architects' creative development for over 500 years. Now I'm going to sort of flip forward uh, a bit now to the, uh, the mid 20th century, which is a sort of, um, I have talked in the past about the periods in between, but just for the purpose of this talk, I'm gonna to go to this period. Uh, and I think it was a very interesting um, period architecturally because by then modernism was no longer new. You know, and still there's the myth that modernism is new. Uh, and sometimes that myth continues to today. But really by then modernism was no longer new and it was ripe for reassessment. And the second world war was a more scientific war than the first, undermining confidence in technological progress as a means of social transformation. And notably for the generation of architects who saw military service, modernism's previously dismissive reaction to social norms and cultural memories became anachronistic. And rather than spread concentrically from one place to uh, others, modernism developed into a polycentric worldwide network of distinct, varied and interdependent regional and local modernisms. And in 1966, uh, so a decade before Charles Jenks actually familiarized the term, uh, Nicholas Pevsner characterized the post-war designs of Le Corbusier and the British architect Dennis Lasden as postmodern. So he described it as postmodern in 1966. And he associated this with the anxious aftermath of, more, uh, of war, which he said, he said that uh, phases of so excessively high a pitch of stimulation can't last. We can't in the long run live our day-to-day -day lives in the midst of explosions. Uh, and this is actually uh, an image of uh, Dennis Lasden's uh, buildings at the University of Sanger. And it's quite interesting um, because there are, seemingly it's a quite modern design, cigarette residential buildings, 
but there are allusions to history uh, within this. For example, um, Richard Einzig and uh, uh, the photographer and Dennis Lasden actually composed this photograph to, refer, uh, to recall the 17th century paintings of uh, Claude Lorraine with a sort of overhanging tree and branches to the left. And I'd say uh, it's not really accurate to describe uh, Lansden or Le Corbusier's post-war buildings as modern or postmodern. I think it's more accurate to categorize them as simultaneously pre-modern, modern and postmodern. And associating history writing with storytelling, Lansden remarked that each architect must devise his or her own creative myth, which is a collection of ideas, values and forms that stimulate design. I think it's a very nice uh, phrase, this, the creative myth. And I think any creative person does need that. Uh, and he also wrote that myth doesn't, that he's using the term in the way that doesn't actually mean that myth is unreal. It might be very, very real. And Lasden concluded, and he said, my own myth engages with history. Now, in a similar vein, and a, um, a short statement that I've been very influenced by, in 1969, Vincent Scully stated this. He said, the architect will always be dealing with historical problems, with the past and a function of the past with the future. So the architect should be regarded as a kind of physical historian. The architect builds visible history. So it's a very interesting way to think about what an architect does, that an architect is creating a history and, and history is, of course, an interpretation of the past in the present, which alludes also to the future. And I'd say that the architect is a historian twice over, as a designer of buildings and as an author of books. And as a design is equivalent to a history, we may expect the historian to have a certain quality of subjectivity that is suited to the objectivity proper to history. And that's a, a statement of Paul uh, Ricoeur. So it's an interesting way to look at what a historian does. It's not that a historian can ever claim uh, objectivity, but the uh, historian might have a subjectivity that is suited to the objectivity proper to history. And, and really interesting historical writing always requires imagination as well as analysis. But the architect does not usually construct a history with the rigor expected of a contemporary historian, and may of course expect, express other qualities, uh, whether personal or cultural. And this is, I think, uh, refers to the overlap between uh, the history and the novel. And histories and novels need to be convincing in different ways. Although no history is unbiased, to have any validity, it must be a truthful to the past. However, a novel may be believable, but not true. And in a, another uh, text that has influenced me, uh, which is called, it has a rather beautiful title, it's The, the Fiction of Function. And that was written in uh, 1987 by Stanford Anderson. And in that essay, Anderson emphasizes that there was no coherent theorization of functionalism in the early 20th century and little indication that it was rigorously applied to design. Instead, he argues, and this is a quote, modern architecture more than at any other time, emphasized stories about fiction. And I think it makes you look at early 20th century architecture in a different way. They were not maybe uh, creating functional buildings. They were creating buildings that told stories about function. And this is actually an image, uh, another image from a current PhD student, Ashling O'Carroll. Uh, it's her work and she's sort of interested. She's a, a, an architect who then became a landscape architect and she is stu studying the 19th century landscape architect, Ville Ledoux, both critically and sort of constructively uh, and pushing forward the idea that uh, reconstruction can be a practice of design. And I'd say from um, what I've read and understood about the origins of the novel and the origins of uh, histories, that maybe the architect can be seen as a physical novelist, as well as a physical historian. Like a history, a design is a reinterpretation of the past in the present. And equally, a design is equivalent to a fiction, convincing users to suspend disbelief. We expect a history or a novel to be written in words, but they can also be delineated in drawing, 
cast in concrete or seeded in soil. And while a prospect of the future is implicit in many histories and novels, it is explicit in many designs. And some architects conceive for the present, some imagine for a mythical past, while others design for a future time and place. Alternatively, an architect can envisage the past, the present and the future in a single architecture. And creative architects have often looked to the past to imagine the future, studying an earlier architecture to selectively appropriate and transform it for the present. And in many eras, the most fruitful architectural innovations have occurred when ideas and forms have migrated from one time and place to another by a translation process that is as inventive as the initial conception. Therefore, a design could be specific to a time and a place and a compound of other times and places. Uh, and this is actually a, an image of, uh, this is a, an image where Ashling exhibited in this uh, 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 exhibition in Copenhagen, uh, about only about a year and a half ago, but in that beautiful time when we could actually travel to places and meet people. It seems such a long time ago, doesn't it? So I, I would argue that 20, uh, 21st century architects can, should appreciate the shock of the old as well as the shock of the new. Uh, and there's obviously lots of discussions about newness in architecture. And to ask what is new involves other questions. Why is it new? How is it new? And where is it new? In William Gibson's memorable statement, the future is already here. It's just not very evenly distributed. And to understand what is new, we need to consider the present, the past, and maybe even the future. Therefore, we need to think historically. Defining something as new is an inherently historical act because it requires an awareness of what is old. And a concern for innovation need not reject the past, and sometimes the old is more radical than the new. In many disciplines today, a number of practices and procedures of differing ages remain relevant and stimulating, and the result is an interdependent network of diverse new and old models of architectural authorship that exist alongside each other uh, or in conjunction, not simply because they are useful, but because they have social and cultural value. Studying the history of practice, as well as the history of architecture, allows us to appreciate that architecture is not only made by architects, and the contemporary relevance of interdisciplinary research, which occurs within and between disciplines, indicates that the profession is but one model of practice and implies that a combination of past and future models may be re more rewarding. Uh, and in this sense, this is one of the things I think I've discovered along the way is that how the architectural design do doctorate, one of its purposes is to consider alternative models of architectural practice that either might expand or even uh, question and challenge the profession. So to sort of um, conclude this talk, I'm going to uh, briefly talk about some of the work of students who graduated from the Bartlett Architect Design PhD program to give you an idea of the range of the subjects and methods employed. Uh, and one of the things that uh, was important is that um, from the very beginning, there was a discussion about the regulations of the PhD and in, in UCL, uh, the maximum a number of words for a PhD thesis is 100,000 words. And there was some assumption that we might change that. And deliberately, we didn't change it because we could perceive a, a PhD which was purely written. And very soon that actually did really happen because uh, it is quite possible, to, just as easy to design through words as it is through drawings. And one example is the doctoral thesis by Kristin Kreider. And site, Kristin is a site-specific poet and all of her work consisted of words, but they were different types of words. Some are words that you might associate with poetry, some with critical analysis, while others combine the two. Uh, and Christine used to run a practice-based uh, PhD program at Goldsmiths, and now is a professor and head of the uh, Ruskin School of Art at Oxford University. As the program has grown, quite a few Bartlett students have developed, uh, tried to develop a number of parallel voices in their writing and drawing. So that there isn't just one sort of character, one type of, of, of voice that comes through the writing. Uh, for example, there might be within the same thesis, a deliberately lyrical text 
in conversation with a, another that is more analytical. And this is actually an image of uh, Alessandro Ayuso's work. And the theme of Alessandro's PhD is the diminished role of the human body in architectural representation and design. And although he's fascinated and interested in the digital, Alessandro associates this problem, particularly with present day uh, digital representation that reduces the body to a cipher or an abstraction. And to make the argument for bodily representations with, within drawn and built architectures, he looked at the Baroque. And he noticed within uh, one of Michelangelo's designs, a little puto, a cherub. And this uh, cherub, rather uh, as in um, Virginia Woolf's Orlando, this little cherub has lived for 500 years from uh, the Baroque to the present day. And as the, the cherub had lived through five centuries, it appeared in various historical moments in Alessandro's thesis. And this little puto became another critical and creative voice within the thesis. The major voice in the thesis was clearly Alessandro and the puto would interject and criticize, telling him what he had uh, actually missed or misunderstood. Now this narrative device allowed Alessandro to consider multiple authors and multiple readers. And throughout his research, I assumed that the puto was another Alessandro. But after his doctorate was completed, uh, Alessandro actually informed me that the puto was also a hybrid, incorporating a lot of him and bits of me and a mutual friend, the Florentine architect, Franco Pisani. Now, many of the students deal with socially engaged work in actual sites, which makes them particularly conscious of architectural authorship using the academic context to reflect on their role as practitioners. And before she applied to the PhD program, Nerios, uh, Neria Amaros Elodoy worked as an architect in Rwanda and was involved in establishing the first architecture school there. And her thesis conceives the built environment as an educational resource uh, and marginal voices as a key to more effective situated knowledge production. And she seeks to improve the learning processes of preschool children who are born and raised in refugee camps in East Africa. Uh, and um, Neria is actually Spanish, but was actually uh, lived in Rwanda before the PhD and is now back there. Now UCL is a multidisciplinary university and it has most subjects, but it, um, it rather curiously doesn't have a music school. And one of the people who came to us um, uh, wanting to do a PhD was uh, Nicholas, uh, was David Buck. Uh, and David is a, a landscape architect who was then running a landscape architecture program at a, another university in London. And he wanted to do a PhD on the musical qualities of landscape. So this is uh, developed uh, a collaboration with the Royal Academy of Music doctoral program. And we soon discovered that our uh, discussions with people at the uh, Royal Academy were enjoyable and easy because rather like architects, uh, they have an idea of notation and composition. They have an idea of a space in which a work is performed and they have an idea of audience. They don't use the same terms as us, but their questions and issues are similar to ours. And it, it's made it a very fruitful combination. And it consequently means that at any one time at the Bartlett, there's probably four or five people doing PhDs that combine architecture and music. And Dave, David, when he came to see us, he was, um, he was aware that a number of architects have connected design to music notation in the last 30, 40 years. For example, um, Ben Archumi in Manhattan Transcripts. But one of the things that was very interesting was that in discussion with Professor uh, Neil Hyde at the Royal Academy of Music, and Neil runs the PhD program there, um, Neil pointed out to David that uh, these architects had actually referred to rather traditional notions of music notation and weren't aware of more contemporary innovative, innovative uh, examples of music notation. So studying contemporary music notation allowed David to look at his own work differently and wary uh, of the assumption that landscape is primarily visual, he came to recognize that the 18th century picturesque is sometimes misunderstood. And researching early and uh, mid 18th century texts and gardens, he found that they included many references to musical and oral qualities in the conception and experience of landscape. And looking at his subject through another discipline's eyes and enabled David to expand his own authorship and to publish a book based on his doctoral research. And one of the very nice consequences for David was that when this book was came out, came out um, on BBC Radio 3, 
there's uh, a number of um, uh, there's one particular weekly uh, radio program where there's always a discussion on that on that program and they actually contacted uh, David and that week's program uh, for about an hour the subject of the program was actually David's book and David with a music composer and the presenter of the program walked around the 18th century landscape at uh, Chiswick House outside London uh, and discussing the themes of the book. My image is not moving. Unfortunately, my... Uh, maybe you can uh, try to stop sharing and re-share. Uh, sometimes it. it helps. I'll try that again. Thanks. No. Oh, how strange. That is strange, isn't it? Let me just... Oh, wait, so I can go back. That's... Ah, isn't that strange? It's now just flicking. Yes, your presentation is telling us to look back, not forward. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Re-evaluate. Maybe you can complete the turn off your presentation. I mean, not our connection, but whichever program you are using to opening it up. And... I, I will try that. Yeah. Always something like this happens, doesn't it? Always. Yeah, it's sort of guaranteed, isn't it, really? <laughs> Let me try again. Okay. So I have reopened it, so I'll try to share it. Is it going forward? So it's obviously gone right to the, I will just go. Okay. So you can see that, can't you? Yes, we Let can. Ah. Okay, wonderful, great. So let's hope it doesn't stop at the same point. No. Ta -da. Great. Works, good. There was one time I always remember the um, it was a presentation by the director of technology at the Bartlett, uh, and of course all the technology failed. <laughs> so, That's like... so one other thing that um, uh, a number of the uh, graduates from the PhD they undertook it because they wanted to develop a working life that combined academia and practice, and questioning aspects of conventional architectural practice and searching for an alternative. Jan Katayn actually entitled his thesis, The Architectural Chronicle, Diary of an Architectural Practice. And as a part of his thesis, he won a design commission in Blackpool. And Blackpool is a, a seaside resort in the north of England, known for its observation tower and brightly illuminated seafront. And uh, that uh, when he actually sort of started to talk with the, the council uh, after he won this commission, they obviously assumed that he would want to choose a site uh, right on the seafront. And instead, he said, no, he wanted to uh, choose an, an ordinary street of 19th century terraced houses a mile from the seafront. And through his gentle and persuasive cons consultation, the residents agreed that their streetlights would be turned off for a week. During the Blackpool Illuminations, which is an annual festival of electric light, and emphasizing a keenly environmental agenda, Jan replaced all the street lights with his own luminaires, which are made of reclaimed and discarded elements. And to generate light, the residents had to feed their new street lights, and there would be one outside each other, each house, and they had to feed them with organic house, household waste. And if they did that every day, they generated methane and thus uh, illumination. Uh, 
And after his doctorate, Jan established an innovative and successful architectural practice. And it was first became known for its transformation of a suburban high street to coincide with the 2012 London Olympics. And it was subsequently commissioned to develop similar urban projects by numerous other London boroughs, combining creativity and community uh, collaboration. Now, another early uh, graduate of the program was uh, Marcus Cruz. Uh, and in his thesis, he argued that the familiar term, the skin of a building, was an inappropriate architectural analogy because it refers just to the external layer. Instead, he proposed a more bodily metaphor, the flesh of architecture. And 10 years later, he became a director of the school, uh, at the Bartlett, and a professor. And about around five years ago, he founded a bio-integrated design masters, which also supervises PhDs on the subject. And, and it's very typical of the spirit of, the, of our PhD program is that it, both the master's program and the PhD program are um, the supervision is organized in collaboration both with the Bartlett School of Architecture and the Department of Biochemical Engineering at UCL. And that really leads me on to you know, running the program. It's, it's sort of interesting how some things I expected have happened, but also some uh, maybe unexpected ones, uh, really. And one of the most rewarding aspects of the doctoral program has been its, see its contribution to staff career development at the Bartlett. And graduates of the program include now uh, six academic staff who are all professors at the Bartlett, who've undertaken a valuable role, such as director of school, director of research, director of communications, and directors of both of the professional programs. And other graduates include professors in Austria, Denmark, South Africa, the UK, and the US, and award-winning practitioners, a director of the world's, one of the world's most influential art galleries, Hauser and Wirth, and a curator of the National Art Museum at the VNA. And keen to ensure that the best design research is published and disseminated. Uh, about 10 years ago now, Murray Fraser, Jane Rendell and I founded the Design Research and Architecture book series, initially at Ashgate and then at Routledge, and now at, at UCL Press. And, and Murray and I are now series editors with Leslie Loco, who's uh, now founding um, the A African Futures Institute in Accra. Uh, and a number of the students, uh, we don't just publish design research that have cut, uh, that's originated in a doctorate, but some of them have come through that route. And about 12 books have been published in the series, and there's a couple more to be published very soon. And to, to finish, I'm going to talk about, very briefly, about the, the book that I've alluded to throughout this talk, which is uh, called Designs on History, The Architect as Physical Historian. Uh, and I, I, I've, I enjoy authored books, doing author books, and I had decided not to do another edited book for a while, but I was approached by RBA Publishing, and RBA Publishing are setting up a new series called Design Studio, which gives a, a lot of importance and value to student work. And there aren't that many architectural publishers who do that. And so I, I wanted to take this opportunity of, um, to do this book, to, which um, includes very well-known practitioners and academics alongside the work of students. Uh, and um, doing that book, I'd say that editing a book is a bit like organizing a party. Uh, you select a theme and then you invite the guests who will stimulate the, the conversation. And the contributors are very wide ranging. There's uh, Perry Culper, in the US, uh, Petzl van Elrikshausen from Chile, uh, Teranubu Fujimori from Japan, Leslie Loco, who's uh, now based in Accra, uh, a, a very interesting range of people as well as British contributors. Uh, and as the uh, a book grows in both unexpected and, and expected ways, the dialogue between the editor and the contributors is rewarding as well as educating. Uh, and, and obviously one of the things that, it, that I find interesting is what I learn from editing a book, what I gain from it. Uh, and I'd say, what have I learned from this volume? Um, I've always been very interested in, there's a novel um, written by Malcolm Bradbury, and it's actually a novel about university life in the 1970s. And it's a book from 1975 called The History Man. And it, it plays very creatively on the relationship between fiction and history. And Bradbury actually describes his novel as a total invention 
with delusory approximations to historical reality, such as is history itself. And in it, you could say that talks about the, the lighter aspect of the relationship between the playful aspect between uh, history and fiction. But of course, there's another uh, way to, to look at, at history. Um, Ashling uh, O'Carroll, who's actually contributed one of the, the articles in the book, um, as she started when her research initially started on Ville Ledoux, and Ville Ledoux is probably the most influential sort of architect in terms of re restoration and reconstruction practices. Uh, and actually what came out, uh, partly through her research and uh, discovering other people who's writing about Ville Ledoux, is that alongside Ville Ledoux's work, there was also a very uh, unpleasant Aryan subtext to his ideas, which was actually quite critical. It's quite typical of the 19th century. And so um, Ashling obviously had to be, take a very cr critical and, uh, uh, approach to um, this work uh, and, and sort of pick selectively from it. And also to, two of the chapters in the book, uh, one by Leslie, who was at that time in, in reflecting on her experiences running an architect school in Johannesburg, and another by uh, Samaya Sam Valley of the practice counter space that are doing the Serpentine Pavilion in London this year. And I think one of the things that really struck me uh, from the various chapters is that uh, one history may need to be categorically rejected in order to formulate another. Instead, selective appraisal may be fruitful. And alternatively, uh, in a more constructive light, past ideas, forms and practices and histories can be acknowledged as incomplete and ready to be revived, enriched and expanded in the present. So I'd argue that combining investigation and imagination, the architect as physical historian has a responsibility to the future as well as the past. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, yeah. It was very um, fulfilling. You mentioned lots of things that I have encountered in my <laughs> throughout my education. So I am trying to um think all the things that you said uh, now i will leave the word to our guests for the any questions and comments and maybe we can also add something in the end again thank you very much um, is there anyone with any questions Um, I might have a question. Hello, um, my Hello. name is Evgi. Um, well, first of all, um, it's a pleasure to listen to you. I mean, I've been reading most of your works for throughout the, I don't know, two decades, for two decades almost. And, um, and thank you for this talk. Um, I actually have this question of, um, to do with the individual authorship uh, questions, which I know that you've been dealing with in other aspects of the practice, but um, you know, uh, having this parallels between um, alternative uh, the role of uh, PhD research in alter uh, alternative practices. Uh, I mean, the role of PhD that um, could open it up in a way, and um, using all these uh, drawing um, um, drawing as a tool to kind of narrate and story tell and. Uh, be a physical novelist, etc. cetera. Um, isn't there this um, still a stigma or dogma about individuality in um, like history writing and doctoral processes that uh, very much is very much linked to the way um, the, um, how do you call it? Um, like um, in terms of uh, building a career and finding these jobs in the schools that kind of, puts a lot of pressure in, in terms of how uh, history is written or how PhDs are produced. Um, so there's this, um, I mean, collectivity, there's a lot of openings in the practice of PhD, obviously. Uh, now we can talk about the role of drawings and research in, in a more open-minded way, but there's still that dogma about individuality. Uh, I know you also addressed other ways of authorship 
um, you know, as a, the role of the author being um, explored through um, different relationships that can be built um, through the act of writing. But still, um, I think there's this um, difficulty that we still have to deal with. I don't know what you think about that. Um, uh, it's an interesting question um, related to a PhD because, you know, in a, uh, certainly in the UK, a PhD is individual work. You know, mm -hmm. it, it, um, and it'd be very interesting for somebody to try to do a collaborative PhD, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, probably the closest you get to it is the science model mm -hmm. where somebody in a, in a, they're working in a lab but they still have to identify their original contribution within the work of, of the lab. Mm -hmm. And for, I mean, you know, there's always some books. I, I, I always find, you know, you, I, I always try to read lots of different things, try and then maybe one, one in a hundred, suddenly it, it hits for some reason. And for me, one of the most crucial texts that influenced me hugely is Roland Barthes' The Death of the Author. And, and it's a very deceptive title because he, he's not talking about uh, really about the death of writing. He's talking about the death of this author as the font of, of all knowledge and the font of all understanding uh, and more uh, of, of an author aware of readers. And, and I've always really thought that was a, such an appropriate idea for, for architecture, the idea of an, a designer aware of, of users and, and aware of the sort of creativity of users. And I, I you know, sometimes terms like agency are used and authorship is, is questioned. And I actually have no problem with authorship as long as multiple authorship is, is recognized. And I, I think my, myself and lots of other people, I think it's quite early days, but I think that people are starting to recognize multi-species authorship. You know, another book recently I've really enjoyed was Donna Haraway's Staying with the Trouble, which is one of the, the better I I examples of that. Uh, and, and you can sort of see it in, in design where people are more and more aware of the potential of collaboration. But I think it would be very dangerous if it also diminished individuality and diminished the author. I don't, I don't think it has to be one or, or another. I don't think it should be seen. I think it should be seen as both and the in, in individuality and collaboration yeah. rather than the other. Uh, I mean, I, I also thought of that when you linked uh, the PhD to the architectural book, uh, the, all the uh, history of the treatises and therefore it kind of links to the Albertian author figure, etc. So. I mean, in a way, we're still bound to, the, to that continuation in some ways. Um, um, I mean, but, yeah. you do get very interesting collaborations, you know, for example, Alison and Peter Smithson is one of the best known ones here, but there's been a lot of fuss about the fact that you probably know about that when um, Robert Venturi got the Pritzker Prize, it was given just to him yeah. and it wasn't given to him and Denise Scott Brown. And interestingly, obviously he accepted it, on his own, which is quite strange in itself. But, you know, I, I think it's really important to recognize the possibility. The, I, I think it's really important to recognize both individuality and, and collaboration can work hand in hand. That it's not, they're not alternatives. Yeah. And now there's all these poss different possibilities of crediting and um, there's uh, a lot of new models that emerge in di different disciplines. So uh, in arts, in software, and so it's not, even that uh, difficult, but yeah, I, I mean, uh, I know it's uh, it links to a lot of other um, realities, uh, like in terms of job applications and the career building uh, element of PhD. So, uh, but I would be very interested in like seeing emer the emergence of different models in that sense too. I mean, one, one interesting example was when Marcos uh, did, Cruz did his PhD at the Bartlett. Mm. He, he, um, his um, time, his working partner, Mayan Coletti, was also doing it. And they, they did a lot of collaborations together. They did a lot of their projects. And in their two PhDs, the interesting thing was they, a lot of the projects were the same, but mm. the themes of the, of the PhDs were different. And Marcos and Mayan had to very clearly distinguish their own interpretations of collaborative work. 
And actually one emphasized one aspect of, of the work, another one emphasized another. So it was very interesting, even within a collaboration where you might say the result is one design, they identified the, their distinct roles and understandings of the work. That's interesting, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Pleasure. Well, uh, I will continue from where Sevgi left in a way. The uh, part uh, that was very exciting and also a little bit confusing for me was uh, in relation to the parallel voices in the writing that you mentioned how mixing lyrical text with analytic work uh, can come together because it brings back all the uh, sayings from my advisors from the past uh, regarding um, all theses can be turned into a book, but not all books are theses and therefore research, especially all those um, issues related to uh, uh, showing uh, to your audience that when they follow your steps, they can reach the same results as you. Uh, you, this is a responsibility in the thesis, but not a responsibility in writing a book because you can clearly create your opinions. Of course, the example you have given was very, very interesting and it's not an opinion and it's a critical voice that is showing up, for example, in this case. Uh, but I was wondering, uh, as for example, committee members, when you come up with suggestions as such, do you have arguments amongst each other what constitutes uh, a PhD work versus, is there a line between the book and the thesis for you or they are all the same? They, they, they tend to be slightly different, but we, I mean, we sort of, um, I, I certainly encourage people to think of the, the thesis as a book uh, and, some people's thesis, then it does get published as a book, but it needs a significant, it still has a significant trans, transformation in it. And other ones much less so. I mean, um, my, my PhD was published as a book called Actions of Architecture. That is pretty much my PhD. It doesn't have that much adjustment in it. Um, and, and I think that's probably more the case these days. I mean, there's a, uh, a friend of mine who's an academic in Ber Berkeley and uh, in the US, and he was, we were talking about it one time and saying about, you know, the idea that once that um, the PhD would go on a shelf in a library and that was it, that was its destination. I, I think there is more of an understanding that PhDs were going to, to lead to books. Um, and I, I sort of think that's also reasonable because it's about getting ideas out into the world and the dissemination of ideas. Uh, and I think it is, I think if somebody is aware of their, their thesis potentially becoming a book with some less or more adjustment, I, I think they're very much thinking about uh, who will read it, what their audience is. Uh, and um, PhD is a very interesting thing because they have to, they have to have be specialized and talk to, to somebody with specialized knowledge. But for example, whenever I write, I, I really have in my mind, one of my master's students, I'm sort of writing for them in a sense. And I'm always thinking about their level of knowledge and understanding and a bright person who might not know all the references, but if I, if I put it in the right way, they will understand, they'll be able to make those sort of connections. Yes, thank you. And in many ways, alternative architectural practices or alternative ar artistic practices that can be searched for or studied or scrutinized through these studies, uh, PhD uh, dissertations, create their own alternative formats and alternative methodologies in many ways. So it's really a reconstruction of many of the uh, uh, what can I say, uh, established academic traditions, which is very refreshing in that respect. There was um, uh, Phil, who was my PhD supervisor and your year in Pelopius. He always used to, when he thought that any of us was getting sort of too angsty about what we're doing, he'd, look, he'd smile, us, smile at us and he'd say, it's only a PhD. <laughs> okay. <laughs> good good course, to remember. He good would to get remember. Back, like, what do you mean? What do you mean? 
And the point he was trying to make, of course, was that a PhD is often, it's a foundation stone of a, of a career, really. Uh, and it's any work should really, what part of its purpose is it leads to another piece of work. And it, in all my, you know, if, if seeing my, all my books, if you read one of my books, you can sort of sometimes guess what the next book's going to be because a sub theme in one book becomes a major theme in the, in, in the next really. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sure. I have a question. Uh, I think it's quite related to this discussion. Uh, I uh, I was wondering about the first establishment of the piece that you already um, uh, mentioned in detail that you and your friends, that you're all having the same approach and you're kind of uh, setting up this revolutionary academic environment in UCL. Uh, but then, I mean, uh, I, I don't know, in Turkey, it's more, more like, I mean, I mean, I'm sure it's uh, still the same in, in the world, but uh, even though in the institution itself, and I mean, in your department or in UCL, er everyone uh, um, agrees with this new approach of uh, PhD, but then from people from other institutions, I mean, if you invite colleagues from other universities to discuss, like to do the sem seminars, etc., cetera, uh, was that easy to, uh, not to convince, but to discuss this new way of uh, PhD with the other uh, institutions as well. I don't know if I could make it clear, but. It, it was very interesting when, when we were developing the PhD and trying to get it established at UCL. And um, there were a couple of friends of mine who were at other universities in, in the UK at that time, who, who um, both sort of were interested in persuading their university to do a PhD like this uh, and they couldn't convince them. And I think one of the things that was to our advantage is that UCL is a, it's a confident university. It's got a big, it's a strong research tradition and it's got many different types of PhD. Uh, so in a way us saying to them, but look, there are all these different types of PhD. There's, there's also the, the Slade, the art school that has their PhD program is that they, they, they could sort of understand it because they, could, they weren't just looking at it in the context of, of architecture or a particular subject area. They were looking at it across the whole university. And I think there was also luck involved because the person at that time who was the head of the, the doctoral school of UCL was somebody uh, called Leslie Aiello, who was an anthropologist. And so, you know, she was an anthropologist who was head of this doctoral school. And for whatever reason, she completely understood why you'd have an architect design PhD. Uh, and I think sometimes there's a lot, there's a bit of luck involved. You know, maybe if we had got a different person in charge in power at that time, it might not have, uh, and, and because she was supportive, it really helped so, to, to push things through. through. Uh, but I, I, you know, I, many times when I talk about the program, I, lots of people in lots of institutions say, you know, we would want to do this but we, could we persuade our faculty? Could we persuade our university? Uh, and, you know, and I think that that's a, that's a common problem, um, but particularly in a university that is more, you know, like, for example, if it's just a technological university, then it's harder to get work established that doesn't fit that, that format. And I, I think it does, it did help us that, um, that UCL has, is very multidisciplinary but it also, I think it, it helps when you can refer to other, I think it's becoming easier because there are more and more programs like this. So any university that wants to set one up can say, but look, these universities around the world are already doing it. Uh, and, and most university institute, universities don't want to feel left behind. So that, you know, there's that sort of argument, but it is a very, I'm also fascinated because, you know, there are lots of times when, I've talked to people in different countries and I think it's often, sometimes it's a discussion about whether you can persuade your university. Sometimes it's also about the, the, the architectural education or the cultural climate. Because for instance, one time I was speaking at the ETH in Zurich, the ETH, where they were thinking about discussing getting a program going there. And apparently one of their difficulties is that in the masters, in, in Swiss architecture education, 
you don't really write. So there's no real written component. So that's that, you know, that becomes a struggle for them. So I think often these, these, the, the, these questions, they're, they're sometimes they're specific to a university, sometimes to a country. And I think it's, it's easier in some places to get, like, uh, for, for example, I think the programs like this, it's interesting that generally um, Nordic countries seem to be quite more open than certain parts of the world. There's obviously Australia. Very interestingly, there's no PhD program like this in the whole of the US. There's the Doctorate of Design in, in Harvard, but that's slightly different. So, and I, I, think, I think these issues are very, you know, they're very, even though we think we live in a global world, in situations like this, you don't really, we, we don't really live in a global world. It's surprisingly parochial at times. I think it's no surprise that in Foda Talk series, our uh, first guest was Katja Grillner uh, uh, from a Nordic country. And also our second guest was Richard Blight, even though he's teaching at uh, Virginia Tech, he's from Australia. So basically, and now we have you, basically, I think we uh, went for the correct people in order to have this exploration. I, I, know, I know Richard was, I mean, I think he's going to try to develop that pro, um, a program yes. at Virginia Tech. And mm -hmm. I know he said to me that was one of the reasons why Virginia Tech were very interested in him moving there. So yes. hopefully that will happen. Yes. I have a rookie question, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. Um, I'm a master's student and I'm still at the very beginning uh, of my academic uh, research. And whenever I um, think of um, going behind, uh, beyond these uh, research tools of architecture, what does my discipline give to me instead of you know, um, these conventional research methods? Um, there's a shadow, a shadow voice always in my head speaking that, well, your research should also be scientifically assessed. And um, at least in my university, architecture department and uh, masters are, is connected to uh, the science, uh, science uh, department, uh, let's say. And um, I'm lost in between whenever I think when I, whenever I think both ends, like science, science and architecture design methods. Um, and if ever your students um, have a similar doubts or questions, what advice would you give to them? Um, I, I mean, I suppose that the difficulty is, I think it's very really true that in, in many universities, there's the, the idea that, that the scientific research is research particularly if the universities have a more scientific technological uh, leaning. Uh, but I think it's really important. And I say that's, I think one of the things that is to, has been to our advantage at UCL is it, it has a very big biomedicine and science side to it, but there are so many different subjects and all those subjects have uh, PhDs. And so it, it's been able for, and, um, it, it's helped us because we, we've been able to say, but look at all these types of research. And I, I think it also, it helps the, the, the master students as well, because they're part of a, of a wider research culture. Uh, sometimes I think, um, I'm sort of repeating what I said, but I think sometimes when you're in a, a, a more single subject university where it's, you know, it's science or it's art, then obviously there's one type of research that tends to become the model. And it becomes a little bit harder to, to explore other types. And we've always been really interested in the fact that within this PhD program, you'd have very socially engaged research, you'd have more arts, humanities research, and you'd have very scientific research. One, I didn't show her work, but, but one of the people recently did a uh, PhD on the redesign of the operating theatre. And, you know, basically the operating theatre has not been redesigned for 30, 40 years. And she dealt with that. And her second supervisor was in the medical, it was a surgeon in the medical school. Another person has done it, uh, a PhD, which combines architecture and neuroscience. Uh, and the interesting thing is I found generally the scientists at UCL are very open-minded. 
You know, they were actually really, and I think also it's to, our, to all of our advantage that most people are interested in architecture. You know, we found that if you, there's somebody who wants to have a second supervisor in neuroscience or medical science or wherever, and you go to them, they're generally really keen, actually. There was another supervisor we had uh, recently, somebody in Hebrew studies. Um, so I think, but I think sometimes institutions can be different to, you know, I think pe people in departments can be very, very uh, open-minded. Sometimes institutions can be, they can get stuck in their own logic a little bit. Thank you. Yes, and uh, I must say Iran is a master's student in one of the very well established universities in our country and uh, we are very lucky to have her as one of our research assistants. And uh, you know the master's programs belong to the graduate school and this graduate school of sciences establishment or at other times graduate school of social sciences, uh, it becomes very harder to tweak uh, the changes, the system in rather better established schools, universities in this country at least. But we'll see what we can do as a younger one. I, I shut up. Yes, I think Ozan, you are trying to say something. Thank you. First of all, I would like to thank you, Jonathan, for your presence, actually, because as Sevgi mentioned, I have been reading your books and your colleagues' works, like Penelope and uh, Yeoria and, and so on, the Bartlett stuff. And uh, your presence is very important from my point of view, because we have struggling around these design research in Turkey that because of its objective, subjective issues. And I usually feel like that, especially in the Bartlett case, uh, to make it scientific, I think Bartlett uses architectural representation as an art, a research lab, because lots of reproductions are produced by your researchers uh, as architectural representations, and they open up exhibitions and so on. And I would like to ask you, what do you think about the role of architectural representation in design research? I, I, mean, I think um, both your year and Penelope are very interesting examples. I mean, in some ways, uh, one of the things that's really intriguing about Penelope's example, uh, because a lot of it is using, uh, one of the things that Penelope is interested in is that using the, the tools of drawing, but not necessarily applying them to design and to tools of architectural drawing. And you see very clearly in her book, The Blossoming of Desire, that, that, that you see it in relationship that she's applying it to the analysis of, a, of an artwork uh, and, you know, I think one of the things that um, is always really uh, interesting and, and I think very, it can be very affirming um, is that um, Penelope, for example, uh, uh, did quite a bit of analysis of whether the, um, she went to the Marcel Duchamp collection in Philadelphia. And then the director of the collection then invited her to speak at a conference about Duchamp. And, and I think that was really affirming for her because she felt that it, she wasn't just being judged within her own discipline. The relevance of her, her work was being rec recognized by the other discipline. And, and certainly, you know, drawing is, is, is staggeringly important at, at the Bartlett. I mean, one of the things that's, I think, very interesting that's happening at the moment um, is that um, a lot of the, the, some of the most interesting new PhD researchers are dealing with the relations between analog and digital drawings. And, and because maybe, uh, you know, architects to some degree have got into a little bit of a rut with a lot of digital production where they're, they're sort of trapped within the software. And, um, and Mayan Coletti's book, Digital Poetics was also of that sort. And I think one of the things I always found really fascinating with Mayan is that in, in, in any um, software. He, he, he tries to find the glitches. He'd always tried to do something in the wrong way. You know, he, he tried to see where the breaks were. Uh, and I, I think it is, it is, um, it, it's drawings are to some degree, it's our language, isn't it? And, you know, that's one of the reasons, it's the, one of the ways that we really communicate with each other. Um, and, uh, and, and maybe in practice, drawing is, is not pushed as far as it could as a means of communication. You know, it's a means of communication to yourself to test things, and it's a communication to others, I think.
Are there any more questions? Karen, can I also ask a question? Please. Uh, uh, actually, I was wondering about the afterlife of the PhD by design process. Uh, I was also, I had a postdoctoral research last year um, about design research and how it transforms architectural education and practice. And um, so I have some observations uh, about the topic, but uh, I'm, I was wondering from uh, your point of view, and uh, if you have observed uh, any transformation after life of the PhD by design uh, in your students' careers, for instance, or uh, if there are transformations um, from taught curriculum to uh, research uh, practice frameworks and uh, or the landscape of architectural practice, maybe. Uh, I would like to hear uh, your observations about the topic. I mean, there's certainly been a very big effect, I think, at the Bartlett, because now um, so many of the architectural staff and, and many of the people who are teaching at the school are doing, have done or are doing an architectural design PhD. You know, it's become a very common thing to do. And I, I think, you know, maybe 20 years ago, it, because there wasn't so many programs, it's, it's less common. Um, and I think people learn certain things from it, I'd say. One of the ones is that there's something in very pragmatically in the UK, there's something called the Research Excellence Framework. And it means about every six, seven years, everybody in a research university has uh, their research uh, ranked. Uh, and um, 15 years ago, there would have been hardly any design submissions for, for, for that uh, exercise. And now there's a huge number. And actually one of the things that your year does, one of her roles at the Bartlett is uh, she deals with all the, the research, uh, all the design research submitted to the REF. And if you go on online, the Bartlett publishes something it's called design folios. And, and they're, they're, they're always there after the, they've been submitted, they're always put there. And I think one of the things that's, it's it sort of allowed um, uh, it's allowed the research councils to accept design much more. It's allowed the, the people to feel that they, I think there was this sort of situation where you couldn't really have a career as a designer and develop your research. You could have it as a career, as a practitioner maybe, and develop your research, but you couldn't have it as a designer. Now you, you can do that. And I, I think there are other things that you, you learn along the way. I mean, one of the things I would say I gained personally from it is I, I learned how to do a book. I learned how to, to do a big, bigger piece of work. You know, I learned how to structure my time, decide the themes. And um, about a few years ago, there was one of the people who um, was doing the PhD who said that she, she'd like to organize this event where we, we asked three people, uh, recent graduates, to say what, what they were doing now and what they'd learned. Uh, and one had done a, a, an architecture PhD, one done, did one in uh, art curating. And the other one um, uh, had done a PhD in interaction design. It was Tony Dunn. And, and Tony is probably, you know, probably internationally, he's probably nearly the best known person in that, in that field of interaction design now. And, uh, and he said a very interesting thing. He, he was asked what he learned from the PhD. And he said, what he learned was how to talk to people not in his discipline. And I thought that was really interesting because you know you could say architects are quite, they're reasonably good at talking to each other, but I don't think they're very good at talking outside their discipline. And he said, this is one of the things that he thought that, that the way that you had to formulate an argument and talk about and contextualize your work in a PhD, that that was a sort of skill um, he'd learned. And, and I, I hope that's one thing, one of the afterlifes and one of the effects of the of des, of design research is that it allows architects to be able to talk better to non-architects, not just to themselves. Obviously, you know, doing a PhD is to some extent talking to your peers and talking to specialists, but it's also finding a way that you can in, engage other people in your ideas and you can make collaborations with, with other subjects uh, and other sort of practices.
So I hope that answers your question. Thank you. So maybe I will add something. Uh, again, thank you for the presentation. Uh, my question is also about uh, questioning the institutional world of academy and the dilemma of um, architecture and sciences, maybe, uh, because you are changing the way of research in architecture. You are trying to change the method. And I guess it uh, involves lots of experimentation throughout the process also. Um, so when I'm thinking about it within the sciences, it's very, it is very linked with the outer world and the, um, uh, for example, it can be funded or maybe linked directly to the outside of the university. But when we are thinking about this uh, experimentational uh, nature of your research and your uh, PhD programs research, uh, how you are forming relations uh, with for example, uh, outside of the university, are there any supports or funds or, uh, for example, how can you uh, find funds for, a, uh, for example, we are talking about writing like a poet or making like a sculpture for that kind of research? I mean, at, at the moment, for uh, anybody in the UK like me who runs a PhD program, we spend a, a huge amount of our time sitting on uh, selection committees for research awards. Uh, there's there's a, a UCL one that students can apply to. Uh, there's uh, the Arts and Humanities Research Council, which is a UK research council. That I mean, obviously, a Brexit is a terrible thing, but one of the things that it's done as a consequence is it's, it's opened up thirty percent of those awards to to, to non uh, non UK, so you can be anywhere in the world. There's, a, a, there's another EPSRC, which is another research council. So there are lots of these means to sort of to, to, to get funding, really. There are the, the current number. And not everybody um, who does the PhD is, is some people are self-funded. You know, they, the ones who are self-funded tend to be members of staff who are doing the PhD part-time or teaching in another institution. Um, one, one of the things I suppose for me, also another important role, external role, is the role of, is the relationship to the architectural profession. And I, I'm always quite critical of the architectural profession, uh, even though I'm doing a book with the RBA at the moment. I think the, the, the RBA is a very, it's, it's, I, I, there's one university that I spoke at quite recently and they very proudly told me that their PhD had been validated by the RBA, by the Royal Institute of British Architects, by a professional body. And I didn't say it, but I must admit my immediate thought was, oh God, how dreadful. Because I think one of the things that's very important about a PhD is it's not validated by the profession uh, and that it can question the profession uh, and, and hopefully expand it in a way. And I, and I do think one of the things that that's, uh, I'd hope the PhD program is doing is, is encouraging and developing researchers who are very, and practitioners, who were very comfortable in interdisciplinary research and practice, that they, they don't necessarily see their work as just existing within the world of architects. And, and that they, the, and it's like I've said previously, I think one of the things a PhD can do is to make connections between disciplines, whether it's architecture and neuroscience, architecture and literature, you know, whatever, you know, and, it's, and it starts to talk about a different type of pra practice really. Uh, a broader conception, because I've always believed that you know, there's the the there's the work of architects, and then there's architecture, and architecture is bigger and broader than the world of architects. Our world of architects is part of that, but a particularly a professional body forgets that completely. You know, a professional body confuses architecture and architects. You know, it thinks they're the same thing, and they're they're related, but they're not the same. Thank you very much. I mean, one of my, my first book I published, which was actually part of my PhD, was The Illegal Architect, you know, which is a, proposing an institute of illegal architects in front of the RBA. Which I, it, was, it was a very enjoyable um, book to write because it's quite a short book and I wrote it with a sort of um, consistent anger one summer. <laughs> 
it was a pleasure to read that <laughs> definitely it was a play it was i enjoyed writing it actually <laughs> very cathartic <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, we don't have any, anyone um, who is asking anything or adding anything. Um, I have a bit of a like a final question, if it's possible. Um, I mean, um, this I would say a disruption to the conventional PhD, the history theory criticism uh, model of PhD is. I mean, it's definitely emancipatory. And I'm very um, appreciative of all these efforts. But um, I mean, I'm also aware of all the criticism that comes mainly from the US, uh, the colleagues. And uh, so, um, and I guess mostly the criticism or the, the question marks arise from the, um, the difficulty of uh, having uh, the right ev evaluation of, uh, of the contribution. Or, I mean, um, maybe if you could. I just wanted to hear your reflection on uh, maybe the the weaknesses or the the threats because uh, we've been talking about all these positive sides, but like what are the main uh, points that needs to be approached with more care when you're doing uh, such an open um, uh, doing a PhD with such an open understanding? Uh, what would be the points to be to I'm pay more attention to? I mean, I, I think it's important that the, you know, that an architectural design PhD should be able to stand up, stand up to all the expectations of a traditional PhD in terms of originality, uh, research questions, understanding and statement of methods, contextualizing, and you know, there are many different um, definitions of what a PhD is, but an original contribution to knowledge is a is a pretty good one. And therefore, the somebody doing the architectural design PhD still has to, like anybody else, has to be able to understand that field of knowledge, situate their own work within it, critique it, and identify the originality. And the, the system, you know, many countries have slightly different systems. The, the UK system for uh, examining a PhD, um, unlike the US system, for example, where it's more done within the university, the, the, the British system is that you have to have two examiners, uh, which are, they have to be people who've examined lots of PhDs. They have to be uh, well-known figures within the, in the field. So that's sort of main, a, a way to make sure that, you, that, the, that the work is really rigorous within its own terms. And, and I, I, I think it's, that's why I, I know, for example, in the art world at times, the, there has been an attempt to sort of think of a, the PhD as a very different sort of qualification to the, the art PhD, for example, as a different sort of qualification to the uh, traditional PhD. And, and we've never wanted to do that. You know, we, we've always said, no, the sort of skills of, of, of research, skills of scientific research, skills of historical research, they, they're valuable skills to learn. You're just sort of, in a sense, combining with them with design skills. And particularly, I think those, um, maybe those skills have always been there because that's the interesting thing about, you know, Palladio did certainly not, he wasn't thinking about a PhD when he wrote the, um, uh, the, the four books, but the, there's, there's lots of technological analysis and information there. There's historical analysis, you know, it's actually, it's an amazingly wide ranging grounded book in many ways. Thank you. And, and I'd say that's one of the, I don't, other places don't necessarily emphasize that, but it's certainly one of the things that we've really emphasized at the Bartlett, that there is this tradition that we're working in. Uh, we're expanding it, mm -hmm. but it's not something suddenly different. You know, the, yeah. it, it's just probably something that hasn't had a PhD tied to it, but it, it is, it's skills that architects have had for centuries, really. Yeah. And especially with, in, the, in the UK with Alvin Boyarsky's, uh, uh, influence uh, yeah. Stronger. yeah thank you Yes, Boshak, I think uh, we can thank uh, Jonathan. Yes, I was waiting for any last words, but I think that's all. <laughs> 
Thank you again for being with us. It was a pleasure to listen to you and having this chat with you. Uh, I want to thank for uh, my university and all my colleagues to you. Um, again, uh, we hope that uh, after this period, we can also host you in our university. Uh, Definitely. Face -face too. I, I'd very much enjoy that. I, I hope to be able to see you to, and see your university and your school. It would be really nice to do that. Hopefully. We would love that, yes. Uh, and, and thank you. Thank you for inviting me. And thank you for all of you asking such interesting questions. It was very enjoyable. It was the uh, same for us. Thank you, thank you very much. Great. Lovely. Really nice to see you then. See you all. Take care. Have a nice Bye. evening. You too. Bye-bye.